Uh, is this working okay? Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Uh, good afternoon, friends. It's absolutely wonderful to be back at this great festival. Um, it's kind of, um, I suppose, just good manners to praise the festival, but um, I can genuinely say that for odd reasons, I've done about 20 festivals in the last two months. Um, and there's nothing anywhere like this festival. I mean, there really isn't. Um, there's lots of fantastic festivals in, in Ireland and Britain and, and elsewhere, but uh, I, I just can't think of anything that has the same sort of range with an extraordinary program of 300 events ranging from boxing matches to uh, the kind of boxing match we're going to have here later probably. But, uh, you know, and the community involvement and the, the uh, level of attention that, that uh, the wonderful audiences pay here is just, just tremendous. Uh, so it's a, it's a real honour and a great pleasure to be back and I'm, I'm just really grateful to be asked back. Um, it's not, I'm not always asked back wherever I go, so it's <laughs> uh, very uh, pleased to be here. Um, I'm going to talk about what I was going to talk about anyway, if that's all right. <laughs> and um, I'll, I'll leave plenty of time for discussion, and I'm sure what I was writing about on Saturday and all that sort of stuff is something people might wish to discuss. If you do, I'm very happy to do so, but I'll, I'll stick with the sort of larger um, subject that I was, I was going to try and talk about. Um, Karl Marx has a great phrase where he, he, he writes that um, people make their own history, but they do not do so in circumstances of their own choosing. And I think it's a, it's a sentence I've always liked because I think it balances out activism, we make our own history, we, we, we have to do things, and the constraints of reality, right, which is we don't pick the circumstances in which history is made. And so I just wanted to reflect for the next three hours or so on, um, <laughs> uh, on where we are in relation to that balance a little bit. I think this is all prognostication, right? It's all guesswork. None of us know what's going to happen in the next three months, never mind the next three years or ten years. But I think there are some things, forces at work, that we can reasonably try to speculate about. Um, and I think it's reasonable to suggest that there's a very strong chance of history being made on this island and on these two islands over the next decade. And what I mean by that is that there's a very strong chance that if we're standing here in 10 years' time, the basic political architecture of both islands will look very different from what it looks like now. Um, and so we are in a historic period. It's equally true to say, however, that the circumstances in which this will happen is not the circumstances I think that most of us would have imagined even five years ago. So the big thing that's changing is a thing called the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. And if we'd been here five years ago and we'd been talking about this subject, I think we would have said, look, there's two very obvious things that we have to deal with and that will determine the future of what uh, the great Scottish intellectual Tom Nairn calls Eucania. Um, what's Eucania going to look like uh, in, in 10 years' time? If, if, we, if we imagine we were here, even say at the beginning of 2014, which was the year of the Scottish independence referendum, if we were at the beginning of that year we were looking forward, you know, the two big things would be pretty obvious, right? We would say, what's going to happen in Ireland? The, processes of change that have been set in motion by the Belfast Agreement of 1998, how that's going to play out, is obviously going to have a very profound effect on the continuing existence of the British state. And Scotland. So we would have said, you know, the rising forces of Scottish nationalism. And I think you probably might reasonably have said, even if the referendum of 2014 is defeated, as indeed it was, something is in motion there. Right. Um, the forces of separatism, of national identity, uh, of a different sense of belonging 
is at work in Scotland. Wales, we might have said, is pretty complicated, and Wales turns out to be extremely complicated. Very divided place. And I'm not going to talk about Wales, and people, Welsh people always give out to me about this, but I just don't know what to say about it. Right? So it's, 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 it's very difficult. Um, but I, we would have been talking about the Irish question and the Scottish question, and how they're going to play out in terms of the continued existence of the Union. Um, and I don't think that would have been particularly controversial. Right? So whatever your point of view, you, you would have been aware that those were two big forces that were working. Um, there was a third force, and there was one that, that I absolutely include myself in this. You know, very few of us were talking about or recognizing, and in retrospect, should have recognized. And it's the English question. The English question is the question, in a way, which has changed the circumstances. So what's going to unfold for us on this island is going to unfold in circumstances, I think, that we probably were not thinking about very clearly five years ago. Certainly I wasn't, and I think a lot of other people weren't either. In retrospect, uh, as I say, this should have been obvious enough. Why? Because if you look at social surveys, you look at the kind of polling evidence, something quite remarkable starts to happen around the year 2000, as it happens. Right? It's a millennial phenomenon. Right? As you enter the 21st century, a funny thing happens in England, and it's that increasingly English people start to identify themselves as English. If you were talking about almost anywhere in the world, you would say, so what? <laughs> you know, of course they do. You know, tell us some news we don't know. French people think of themselves as French, German people think of themselves as German, Italian people think of themselves as Italian, so what? Well, the so what is interesting, right? So why is it news? And why does it begin to happen in around 2000 and in the years thereafter? Um, it begins to happen for pretty, in, re in retrospect, pretty obvious reasons, right? Which is, obviously, at the end of the 20th century, two big things happen in relation to the political architecture of these islands. One is the Good Friday Agreement, 1998, which amounts, it's complex, it has obviously lots of qualifications to it, but it amounts to a very clear agreement that Northern Ireland can leave the Union at any point. It, it, you know, it, it is a remarkable document. You know, we, we take it for granted, but it is a very rare example of an existing state agreeing a part of the state has an absolute right for, a, you know, if a majority so decides to leave that state at any point. But there's nowhere else in the world where that exists, right, where you have a state which is kind of saying this very clearly as an absolute right. Look at Catalonia, for example, and the, the huge difficulty the Spanish state will not recognize that Catalonia has a right to make that choice. Um, so this is, that's one big change. But remember, just a year later, so that's 98, 99, is the foundation of the Scottish Parliament. And initially, you know, the Scottish Parliament is part of a kind of Blairite, Brownite, project of protecting the Union. Right? So the idea is granting a limited home rule to Scotland will solve the Scottish question. Right? Scottish people will be happy enough with it. Historically, it doesn't tend to work like that. Right? Historically, parliaments don't just represent people, they also, in a way, invent the people. Right? So the people are like the parliament, but the parliament also reminds you in a daily sense that you are a people. Right? It, 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 it legitimizes the idea of thinking about oneself as a separate political community. And this is exactly what's happened in Scotland. So we know those two big things happen. What was less obvious, but I think very profound, is that almost immediately you begin to get an effect in England which is saying, well, if the Irish can bugger off at any time, and the Scots 
are increasingly vocal and self-assertive in terms of saying we're Scottish, not British. What about us? Why should we be stuck in this British thing? Um, do we not have a right to be English? And I think it needs to be said, because the form this has taken is so insane, but it's not an unreasonable question. Right? It's a question that the English have a perfect right to ask of themselves. Are we not a political community too? And in fact, it's rather remarkable if you think about it that it should even be a question. Right? Uh, and so we have to explain wh why is it a question that arises only as a reaction to the development of the Belfast Agreement and the Scottish Parliament? Why does it happen when people start looking at that? And the reason it happens is because <clears throat> English national identity is a very strange beast. Right? There's, there's nothing else I can think of parallel to it. English nationalism is very old. Right? Um, there's an English nationalism long before there's an Irish nationalism. Right? You know, while Ireland is still very much a kind of fragmented um, Warring. It has a cultural unity. It has a sense of itself, but it doesn't. It's not a nation state, right? We never had a kingdom here, for example, before before colonialism. The Scots, you know, at least managed. But we never managed it. So we, we we were kind of late to the game in a sense in terms of a functioning national identity. The English had one in the 14th century, right? So they're arguably, you could say, the first really functioning nation state is is England. The Normans moved in, uh, ruthlessly took over the first colonial uh, power, the first colonial expansion is of course the conquest of England, um, which is absolutely ruthless and incredibly efficient. You have the same kind of um, transfer of land, for example. People look at Ireland, the, the transfer of land from Catholic ownership to Protestant ownership, uh, after well, after Cromwellian settlement and then after um, the, the, the beginning of the planting of Ireland is absolutely remarkable, incredibly efficiently achieved, right? You have a massive transfer of, of land ownership. The same thing had already happened in England in the 12th century, right? So William the Conqueror, they, they take over the land. You've got the Doomsday Book, which actually gives you, tells you who owned the land at the time that William the Conqueror came in and who owns it now, 30 years later. And 92% of the land have been transferred. It's incredibly efficient. So there's the creation of a very, very uh, effective, powerful, coercive state. And it is a nation state, right? So it, it very quickly emerges as one that has what you would expect of a nation state, a single government, a single national language, and a single set of laws, and its ability to project its power both internally and externally. Right? So if that's what you think of as a nation state, they've got one very, very early on. And it's a, it's a very aggressive kind of nationality, right? It it's, expresses itself in fighting the Scots and invading France, mostly. <laughs> so what happens to it? What, why, does it why, are we, why do we find ourselves in the years after 2000 with the English saying, well, hold on, we want to be a nation as well, maybe. But what, what happens? Well, you know, it's no great history. What happens is a kind of bargain, right, which is that this English identity gets folded into two other constructs. And the word construct is, is, is reasonable in the circumstances. Right? It's not a natural phenomenon. This is something that has to be constructed. And those two constructs are Britishness and empire. Right? You, you, know, you know this is not, I'm not telling you something new. But it's just worth kind of thinking about a little bit. Because it's, it's not, you know, we take it for granted in a way that this happens, but it, it, is, it is a process and it takes quite a long time to achieve. Um, very interesting if you look at Shakespeare, right, one of the great creators of an English national consciousness in a way. Before 1603, Shakespeare never uses the word British, never appears in his plays. After 1603, he uses it a hell of a lot. Why? Because James II of Scotland, James VI of Scotland, becomes James I, rather, of England, wants British 
consciousness to be created. And Shakespeare works with him. Shakespeare is, is the court playwright. So he's writing about Britain, so the Britishness is there. It's an invention, it has to be created. And the English hated for a long time. The English despised the Scots. You know, they, uh, they're, they're, you know, they're, they have a really profound prejudice against um, the other parts of, of Britain. But the sweetener, the thing that makes sense of it in the end, of course, is empire. Right? The bargain is simple enough. Right? If you're going to construct a global empire, you have to dominate your own backyard. And in order to dominate your own backyard, you have to find a settlement that includes Scotland, Wales, and very problematically Ireland, right? So, but at least in theory, that's the idea, right? That you can, you control the archipelago, and then from that archipelago, you can build a global empire. And for all the difficulties in Ireland, certainly on the island of Britain, this works, right? It's, a, it's an incredibly successful construct. It's possible because the English are able to really do a trick which for a long time drove the Scots crazy, right? which is just referring to England and Britain as if they're the same thing. Right? So um, this is still done in extraordinary ways. Um, I know you're all absolutely devoted to uh, the royal family and, and, and follow it in great detail. I, I'm sure you will have seen the official photographs of Prince George the future king of England, king of, sorry, the future king of the United Kingdom. <laughs> what, the, the official photographs, he's wearing an England football shirt. And you think, oh, you still don't get it. <laughs> you still, like even at that level, do you imagine the amount of thought that goes into the propaganda that's being, the images being created, but it's still this arrogance, you know, well, England is Britain, isn't it really? Um, but that construct was very successful for the English, right? It worked for them. It also, to a very large extent, worked for the Scots. I mean, the Scots were willing partners in this for a very long time. They got a big share of the empire, right, out of um, sublimating their nationality right, into this British construct. Um, the problem then is uh, that's what you folded it into, right? and, and uh, you've kind of allowed this ambiguity where. If you're English, you can just say, Britain is England. England is Britain, it doesn't matter. And then suddenly you have both the Scots and the Irish causing this kind of trouble at, at the end of the 20th century, by, by creating a sense that actually maybe this union isn't permanent. Maybe it is a construct, and maybe it can be changed. And if it can be changed, where are we in that? What happens to us? So, there's a couple of factors here, obvious long-term ones. The rise of nationalism in Scotland is a big one. Uh, secondly, of course, the end of empire. Right? If, if it was an imperial construct, and it was, right? it's a construct for imperial purposes, then it can't outlast the end of empire right? too long. There's also other factors like one can't underestimate the degree to which this Britishness was expressed in military terms, right? So, so one of the great binding forces was the idea of British military might. Um, it's very striking just looking at the exhibition, the Ballymurphy exhibition here, you know, and, and in retrospect, you know, if you think about why did they respond like that? You know, the, rationally, right? It, it was not in the interest of the British state to respond by murdering people on the streets of Belfast. Right? You know, they're supposed to be a very sophisticated, capable, thoughtful Mandarin class. Like, there are other ways of trying to manage conflicts. Why do they do this? They do it because it's the imperial knee-jerk response. Right? It's, it's the thing they do. And it's an enormous part of a mentality. Um, it feeds into Brexit, right? Jacob Rees-Mogg says, Brexit, it's crazy. Crazy was 13, 12 at this moment. It's crazy, it's Agincourt, it's Waterloo, and we always win these things. <laughs> you know, it's that sort of sense that military might and military victory is the positive expression of the legitimacy and the power of the British state. 
that's why you end up shooting people in Ballinor, right? Because when it comes to it, that's how you show that the state is really in charge, right? The, the subtler ways of trying to do this don't really matter. You cannot underestimate the extent to which, and this is really not talked about much in Britain, but Britain suffered two huge military defeats in the early 21st century. It was, the British army was profoundly defeated in Helmand province in Afghanistan, in that adventure. The Americans had to come in and rescue them. And exactly the same thing happened again in Basra, in, in, in Iraq. So its involvement in Afghanistan and Iraq does two things. One is it's incredibly divisive, so it breaks the whole idea of the military thing being the way in which we reinforce consensus. Think back to how Margaret Thatcher, for example, used the Falklands very successfully to stop a sense of Britain's falling apart. Um, you know, we, we express our military power outside the country and that brings us together. That's the, that's the story. That story's not working because both, well, particularly the Iraq war, of course, is, is for obvious and completely justified <laughs> reasons, extraordinarily divisive with, within England itself. But also, it's one thing to be suckered into a war quite another one to be suckered into a war that you lose. And there's no glory, right? So, so the glory can make up for the mendacity of the way that people were taken in, but there isn't any glory. And I think that's also a very important factor in, in what's beginning to happen. So what do we see? Well, we see something really, I think, unprecedented. I can't think of anything quite like it. Um, Nationalism, a sense of national identity, a sense of belonging, a sense of wanting to be your own political community. A absolutely common human impulses, right? It's, it's everywhere. And I do want to stress, I'm, 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 I'm not being facetious about English nationalism, right? As I said, they're, they're perfectly entitled to it. The problem is that it's not like any other nationalism I know of, right? Nationalisms around the world have movements, political parties, national theatres, national poets, you know, there's a whole hinterland of thought and expression that goes into hammering it out, I mean, thinking, of, thinking through what is it we want, who are we, how, how do we define ourselves, what kind of political institutions should come out of this. None of that's happening, right? So it's, it's a strange phenomenon of a nationalism that's emerging but dare not speak its name. Right? So it has no voice. It has no real expression going on. The only expressions of it then are in football hooliganism, in you know, singing songs about two world wars and one world cup when you're playing the Germans, you know, uh, a certain degree of far-right fascist um, skinhead expression of it. And then weird phenomena. Like it's, it's very interesting strange things like the death of Princess Diana, for example, is the first time that you see the English flag out on the street. Other than for far-right, you know, neo-Nazi rallies. People use that somehow as a moment of national mourning where national meet, suddenly they find doesn't, they don't want to have the Union flag which represents the monarchy and the state. They're in a very anti-monarchical mood, so they bring out the flag of St. George. I mean, odd kind of expressions like that, but no real proper thought through political expression of it. Um, there are some expressions, uh, some, some exceptions. There are some very, very laudable political thinkers on the left, mostly, who are trying to say, hold on a minute here, there's something going on here, and it's not unreasonable, and can we give it some kind of genuine, democratic, progressive expression? But they're treated as, as, as nutcases. Um, and academically, I've spoken to some, a couple of very senior, you know, respectable political science academics start studying it. Some of them are saying, you know, it almost finished my career. Like the very fact that you were studying it was treated as the fact that you must be some kind of fascist. <laughs> Who else are crank? Who else would be interested in this stuff? And yet, what's happening is dramatic, right? So at the end of the 20th century, you ask, people in England, you give them the choice, it's a classic question, right, which is a kind of multiple choice question. Are you British, English, or both? Right? You, can, you, can, you can tick both boxes, no problem. <coughs> Overwhelmingly, I mean, over 90% of, of people in England will tick either just British 
are British and English. Right? By uh, this process, you know, the, the SARS going on, by about 2011, 2012, a majority of people in England are saying English only. So even given the choice of saying British and English, they're saying no, English. 60% of people in England in the last census, which was 2011, said English only. It's an extraordinary phenomenon. Given that this is not really being promoted by a political party or you know, pushed by anybody outside, it's a, it's a genuinely organic phenomenon, whether we like it or not, you know, it's, it's, it's coming up from below. This is what people are saying. And this is partly what has driven Brexit. Right? The English are beginning to say, you know what, we want out of this union. And they're being ignored, right? Nobody's listening to them. Nobody's paying the slightest bit of attention to the media, in politics. You know, it's just not there. And then they're given a choice to exit something. You know? And they say, yeah, sure, we will get out of that too. But it's, it's, Brexit is an expression of this very deep unhappiness about belonging. But it's not an answer to it, right? Because I, I think it's a, 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 some, a, you're a very young audience compared to me, but some of you may remember Lassie or Skippy or those, you know, that <laughs> you know, used to be on, on TV when I was a kid, you know. Um, and there were these mad, wonderful animals, you know, who would, like a kid would have fallen down a well, you know, and, and, and Skippy would sort of see the kid and go off and go, <laughs> and, and the other kids say, oh, there's a kid who's falling down the well. Let's go, and, let's go and get the kid out of the well. And this is like a Skippy, Skippy episode, except the kids don't understand what Skippy is saying. You know, it's like, so the English are saying, we've fallen down a well. You know, there's a big hole here where our sense of belonging should be. And, and we're very unhappy about this. We don't trust Westminster. We don't trust any of this anymore. It doesn't represent us anymore. And, and they're given a choice to they're given a voice or they say something, shout out something from down the well, and just come along and say, we can't hear you. You know, no, no, oh, what, what are they saying? Oh, there's, I know what they're saying. They're saying the precious, precious union. <laughs> we must have the union. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, we hear you. We hear you. You know, it's, it's an astonishing thing that's going on. So, of course, I mean, history is a great joker, you know, to, one of the reasons why they're saying fresh press union is you throw in the DUP into the mix, right? So you, you give the DUP the balance of power, and what happens is that British governments, instead of saying, you know, there's an English thing going on here, maybe the union isn't quite the answer to all the problems here, doubles down on, on unionist rhetoric. Boris Johnson, I don't know if you've noticed, he's not just prime minister, he declared himself minister for the union. An entirely new invention, you know. And rhetorically, he's, you know, in his um, his his leadership campaign said the union first, right? But the union is the first thing; it's the main thing; it's all about. Now contrast that with what what are Leave voters in England saying, right? So this is what they're being told they're saying, but what are they actually saying? With lots of studies, there's actually huge evidence, I mean, very, very strong empirical base of evidence of asking people what they think. Um, and what they think is, we don't give a good goddamn about the union. You know, I mean, if they're saying it as clearly as you possibly could find. 75% um, of people who vote to leave in England say they would be perfectly happy if, if the Brexit leads to Scottish independence. 74% say if uh, Brexit leads to United Ireland, they're perfectly happy with it. Uh, even more important, right? I, I said there's something even more fundamental than that. Right? A union, it may have lots of rhetorical and poetic dimensions, right? We can talk about it in all sorts of ways. What it's really about is taxation. Right? The real test of a union is, is it okay for my taxes to be used over there to subsidize a poorer part of the country, subsidize the public service to make sure we all have the same NHS, for example. Right? Yes, I do feel enough affinity with you as a person and you as a community up there to think that if we've got a surplus of taxation, 
in England and in the very wealthy southeast of England, it's fine for that tax, some of it, to be used to subsidise public services in Scotland or in Northern Ireland. Again, almost exactly the same figures. Three quarters of Leave voters in England say, I do not want my taxes to be used to subsidise public services in Scotland. And a slightly larger number, I think 76% of them say, I definitely don't want them to be used to subsidise public services in Northern Ireland. Right. This is profound. I mean, this is, you know, this, this is really, you don't have a union if people have withdrawn their consent from that sort of very basic idea, right, which is, we're in this together. Once you stop believing that, something is over. Now, the odd thing is, in a way, Brexit takes a lot of energy, right? So it takes it and it says, well, we're doing something. We're, we're, we're in rebellion. And of course, Brexit is increasingly using the language of national revolution. I mean, it's, some of it's almost funny if it were not so serious in its consequences. You know, Independence Day. So one of the bizarre things that Brexit does is, and I've tried to argue this in that book, you know, is that one of the stranger psychological dimensions is, it's a kind of last stage of imperialism, uh, you know, where imperialism is basically about taking stuff from other people. <laughs> when you've taken everything from other people, there's one thing left. You can take their pain. You can turn the whole thing around and you can say, oh no, we're the ones who are colonized. We're the ones who are oppressed. We're the ones who are in need of a national revolution to throw off the horrible oppression in which we exist. There's a long tradition of this, which you know, I, I won't go into, but it, it's, it's sort of expressing itself in, in this weird language in Brexit, right? which is, Brexit is our English national revolution. Uh, we, we, have, we, have, we have been intolerably oppressed for the last 45 years, and, and now we're, we're going to have our Independence Day. So it, it, it dresses itself up in that, and, and to some extent, right, it, it draws in some of that energy. Right? It's, it's, it's going to fill that vacuum for a while. But it's not going to fill it for very long, right? because suppose do or die, Boris Johnson leads Britain out of the European Union on October 31st, what are you left with? Where are you then? The precious, precious union. You're back to saying, and now it's Britain. It's the union. We're free. We're a new, we're a whole new golden age. British golden age is about to begin. And people in Scotland and people in Northern Ireland and a lot of people in Wales are saying, what? <laughs> no, that, that's not what this is about. You know, we're not interested in this union thing anymore. So th this is part of what's playing out. So, so to go back to about the, you know, these are the circumstances that I think we would not have anticipated even five years ago. But I, maybe people are smarter and saw this coming, I certainly didn't, right? So that the most potent force in breaking up the union is England. And if that is the case, then we have to think very carefully about what the consequences of that are. Right? How, how does that play out? In terms of different strands of Irish nationalism, you know, the way of thinking about this is that Ireland will be the agent in a way that breaks up the union, at least from, from our point of view. Right? From, from, the, from this island side, there will be a moment of severance, and a United Ireland will, will happen in that context. Uh, and whatever happens on the other island, it's up to them, right? So, so in a way, that's perfectly reasonable. But the problem is that the, the, the forces at play are actually different forces. And they raise for us a couple of questions, uh, which I'd just like to throw out in terms of suggesting that we have to think very carefully about, about all of these. They complicate the idea of how this island is going to plan its future. Right. So the first question I would suggest is the Scottish question. Right. Uh, Scottish independence has always been <coughs> a large factor, I think, in terms of thinking about Ireland's future. 
It's been a large factor because many people in this part of Ireland, their strongest identification as unionists is not with England, it's with Scotland. Right? The culturally and religious terms, socially. And what happens in Scotland is going to have a profound effect on the identity of many Protestant and unionist people in, in, in Northern Ireland. So we have to respect that and we have to think about it. But there's a new dimension to this, right? which is the European Union dimension. Right? So the first part of that would always have been obvious that what happens in Scotland is going to have some impact here. We're going to have to think about that. The second part of it, you know, before Brexit, we weren't really thinking about this, which is Scotland has voted overwhelmingly against Brexit. And Scotland is likely to become even more alienated from London, so long as, well, we, we'll see how this plays out, but if, if Johnson stays in power, and if he forces through an LG of Brexit, Scottish independence is back on the agenda with, with an alacrity, I think, which none of us would have expected in 2014 when, when the referendum was to be. The new dimension to this is, suppose Scotland becomes independent, What's the first thing it wants to do? It's rejoin the European Union. How does it do that? Uh, I'm just suggesting this question, right? What's, what's, what's the nearest part of the European Union to Scotland? Right? <laughs> it's, it's Ireland, right? It, it, um, so one possible model, and I, I, I'm really struggling with that. We're getting now into the realms of speculation, but this is where we have to think, right? One possible model for Scotland getting back into the European Union. So the official model, right, remember, is a 10-year negotiation process. They're, they're outside, they're a third country. It, it's as if they were, you know, um, a Serbia. You know, they, they've got to start all over again. Um, that, that doesn't seem like the model that most Scottish people want, right? They regard themselves as members of the European Union. They want back in. How do you do that? There'd be huge um, sympathy in the European Union, right? They'd say, oh, Scott's always on our side, we want them back in. How do you do it? How do you do it without saying to every other country that wants us in the queue to get in, well, we're letting Scots skip the queue because we like them, they were kind of in before. You can't really do that. There is a model, and it's the German model. East Germany was not in the European Union. It joined the European Union by joining Germany, joining West Germany, which was in the European Union. And there's a precedent, right, which is saying, you know what, if you become part of a larger political entity, uh, which is already in the European Union, you're automatically in. You don't have to negotiate your way in. <laughs> no, I'm not, no, I'm not saying, I'm not saying we have a Republic of Ireland. Scotland. No, but, but, but is there some other kind of arrangement? Is there some other kind of way in which we can think about the architecture which, after all, is the European Union zone on this archipelago, right? It is a reality, right? So, so in trading terms, for example, in market terms, in, in you know, in, in just in terms of commerce, it, Scotland would 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 be in the same trading zone as Ireland, and would be you know the nearest neighbour with, within that context. Is there a way in which we can think of, uh, think creatively about how that might be done? I don't know. I'm just I'm asking these questions. The second big question for us is going to be, what kind of England emerges? Right. Uh, whether we like it or not, the, the English can't tow themselves away from continents of Europe, much as they might like to, and we can't tow ourselves away from England. Right? We're, we're, we're stuck with them. They're, they're the neighbours, you know, and even if your neighbours go crazy, you're, you know, you're still stuck with them. And it matters hugely, I think, to all of us on the island, you know, that, that some kind of progressive, civilised democracy eventually emerges in England out of this whole process. Um, if England ends up, which it could do, and again, it's being speculative, but it's not beyond the bounds of possibility that it ends up as an extremely reactionary, right-wing, authoritarian state. Why? Because you've got the most toxic poison is already in the groundwater there, which is betrayal. Well, Brexit was going to be betrayed from the moment it was born. The great betrayal of Brexit was winning the referendum. It was pure, 
It was fantastic, it was anything you wanted it to be until it became real. And then you have to say, what is it? And once you start saying anything about what it is, it's being betrayed. Right? That pure vision is gone. And this stuff is there. Johnson's made it much worse. Right? Johnson's up the ante by saying, we're leaving, come what, you know, come what may, on the, on the 31st. And if we don't, you know, we're, 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 where is this going to lead itself? At the moment, there's probably something between 30 and 40% of the population of England which wants a hard no-deal Brexit and thinks it will be fine. And there's no way out of this. So you either get what you want or you don't get what you want. If you get what you want, it's going to be awful. <laughs> I mean, if they get an ideal Brexit, well, you know, it's a, going to be a classic case of be careful what you wish for. And if they don't get it, of course, it's going to be, a, a, you know, a historic betrayal of the democratic wishes of British people. So they're, they're stuck with this dilemma. And okay, so not for us to solve it for them, or we can't solve it for them, even if we wanted to. But. Uh, it matters enormously to us, I think, whether the other possibility, right, which is, remember, there are also extraordinary English traditions of, of, of uh, socialist traditions, social democratic traditions, feminist traditions, <coughs> egalitarian traditions. You know, the English um, uh, traditions have produced a lot that's enormously valuable and that perhaps one of the long-term consequences of Brexit might be freeing England from the Ukrainian state. The Ukrainian state, as we were saying, is an imperial state. And in a way, England is trapped within that. It's trapped within it as a democracy, right? It's a democracy that doesn't work. One of the things we're seeing is the playing out of the death throes of that democratic system, the mother of parliaments nonsense, yeah? I mean, just look at, just look at what happened the other week. I mean, can you think of another democracy in which a prime minister is chosen by 90,000 people and then goes to a monarch directly to be inaugurated as prime minister without even going through parliament, without even establishing that he has a majority in parliament? This is feudal. You know, they're stuck with a lot of this, the trappings of this imperial state, which they do need to shake off. The, the first past the post system, you know, which is a traps millions and millions and millions of voters in, in constituencies where their vote doesn't matter. This stuff is shattering and breaking up. And it can break up in, in, in two very different ways, and it will matter to us a lot how that happens. The third big question, then, is, is what, what do we do with Britishness on the island of Ireland? And we have to think about this, I think, very, very generously and very, very openly and very sympathetically. One of the things we have to remember, and it is a great paradox, is there is now one part of the United Kingdom in which a plurality of people identify as British. It's right here. A plurality I means not a majority, but the biggest single group of people in a multiple choice state. Right? The, the plurality in England now identifies as English. The plurality in Scotland identifies as Scottish. The plurality in Wales identifies as Welsh. The biggest number still just about in Northern Ireland identifies as British. Right? It's, it's one of those kind of funny things that history throws in. Right? So that, 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 but what happens to Britishness in Northern Ireland if there is no union? It has nothing to be united to. And I think it's really important that we we approach this question, as I said, generously and sympathetically. You know, it's a, it's a question for all of us. And it's a question for all of us because it's the question in the Belfast Agreement, remember. The Belfast Agreement does not go away because of Brexit, which we've been all rightly insisting on. It also doesn't go away in the case of the United Ireland, right? The Belfast Agreement is there as a fundamental statement. And it's a statement that people have a right to be Irish or British or both as they may so choose. And here's one I just maybe throw out, right? which is, wouldn't it be an extraordinary paradox, and it's not an unthinkable one, that the only remaining guarantor of the British identity of Northern Protestants 
is the, the new Irish state. <laughs> no, this, this may well be what we're looking at, right? That, that the, 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 the inheritor of the guarantee of this British identity is, is, is going to be Ireland because of the Belfast Agreement. Um, but also because of, I think it's just really important that we think about that phrase as part of the Belfast Great Good Friday Agreement, remember, the constitution of the Republic was changed. And it was changed in a consensual way. 93% of people, I think, voted for this change. And it changed the territorial claim into a very different kind of formula. What it now says is that it is the desire of the Irish people to unite the people who share the island of Ireland in all the diversity of their identities and traditions. There's nothing quite like this anywhere that I know of, right? You know, the Irish Constitution recognizes, first of all, that unity of people is what this is about. And secondly, that unifying people does not mean turning them into a monolith, right? So there's not a claim that says you have to be exactly like us or there is one version of this identity. It doesn't even say there are two, by the way, right? So it doesn't say Protestant, Catholic, British, Irish. It says all the diversity of their identities and traditions, right? And this is important to us. 17% of people living in the Republic, I'm not sure about the figures in, in, in Northern Ireland, but they're not too distant from that were born outside of Ireland. The second most spoken language in the Republic, and in some ways it's sad, second most spoken language at home, in the homes in the Republic of Ireland now is, is, is no longer Irish, it's Polish. Um, we have a plurality of identities and traditions, right? And this is not something to be afraid of, right? You know, we, we, we know that human beings are perfectly capable in the right political circumstances of living with diversity, of living with plurality. Now, we all live with contradictions. We're all many, many things. But what kind of political structures might honor that plurality? This is the question we have to ask, right? I would just throw it out there that I don't think whatever political structure we end up with can be a monolithic political structure. Right? I don't think a simple sense of saying, you're all in the same package now, we have one centralized government in Dublin, and that's, that rules you whether you like it or not. Right? It, it, it's going to have to be a much more radically reinvented democratic system. One that's much more decentralized, gives much more power to actual people to get involved in making decisions for themselves, and honors people's sense of their own traditions and identities, right? without, without threatening anybody. But we have to think very carefully about this. And the last question I'd just like to ask is, uh, what would we like to preserve of Britishness from Northern Ireland? I, I'll tell you what I'd like to preserve. I'd like to preserve two big things. I'd like to preserve the National Health Service. And I'd like to preserve the traditions, at least not being honoured now, but the, the traditions of, of, of public housing provision. If, if, if I'm thinking about what Ireland might look like, I really want it to look like a place where people have democratic access to healthcare as, a, as an absolutely fundamental right and, and central to human dignity. I really want it to look like a place where housing is not a commodity, a market commodity out of which you know, more and more and more people are locked. Um, the British social democratic tradition, which really you know, came into its own in, that, in those years after the Second World War, is a magnificent tradition. You know, a, a tradition of saying that there are basic human rights, which are not just legal rights, they're also social rights. Rights to housing, rights to healthcare, rights to education, you know, rights to, to belonging and community. Um, I'm perfectly happy, <laughs> and I think I would be delighted, to see those aspects of Britishness honoured and, and, and brought into whatever kind of way that we think about the future architecture of Ireland is. But we, we need to begin to think about those things, and how do we do them? You know, what, what, what is, how do you get from the appalling kind of fragmented, privatized healthcare system that you have in the Republic 
into a genuinely national health service that we ought to have on the island as a whole? How do we get back to a sense that people have a right to public housing? Those kinds of things have to be part of the discussion. Right? It's not an abstract discussion, it's about people's lives. So I've gone on far too long, but I, I, I just, what I want to suggest here is, even if you think some of my questions are ludicrous questions, and I'm sure you do, they're questions that need to be teased out. Right? And they're questions that we need to begin to tease out and out. Right? We don't know where the Brexit stuff is going. It's a mad careening train that has no driver at all. And we don't know what its immediate or even short term or even medium term impact is going to be. What we do know is that things are in train, that fundamental shifts are happening. And it is vastly better for all of us, and I mean all of us, I mean unionist, nationalist, Protestant, Catholic, British, Irish, to begin to have a civilized, open conversation that involves real citizens in this, right? Not a, discussion among media elites like me or, or political elites. I mean, we, what we need is we need to start doing citizens' conventions right? where, you know, randomly chosen so-called ordinary people, there's no such thing, you know, get to engage with thinking some of these questions through, right? which is how do we do this thing? How do we build for ourselves a, a pluralist democracy in which everybody can feel comfortable? Um, and, and how do we relate uh, to our, our possibly um, extremely upset neighbor uh, over this time? And how do we do that in the context of remaining in the European Union? These are huge questions. I think there are questions to which there are positive, exciting, um, progressive answers. But I think if we don't give those positive, progressive, exciting answers, some of this vacuum can be filled by, by chaos uh, by uh, cynicism, which we're seeing plenty of, and possibly even by civil unrest. Um, so I hope we are able to begin that process of conversation. Thank you very much indeed. So maybe I'll just talk about what I was suggesting on. I, yeah. Has anybody really read the thing I did on Saturday? Okay, yeah. okay, has to be right on Saturday. okay so I'll, I'll just explain it very, very briefly, right? So it, it, it's um, I, I, so I, I was trying, right? I, I, know, I know a lot of people will profoundly disagree with me, and, and I'd like to hear that too. I'll just tell you what I'm trying to do, right? Which is we're in a very strange situation, right? Which is that there are two imperatives, right? One is that. Boris Johnson, after Thursday, has a majority of one. In effect, it's two, right? There's a, a Tory MP who's been accused of rape, who is still in Parliament but has lost the, the whip. So it's basically two, right? Uh, it's very complex, right? Because on the big Brexit issues, the no deal Brexit issues, you have some Labour MPs, and we don't know how many, who might actually vote with Johnson. You also have a significant number of Tory MPs who will vote against them, right? So it's, a, it's an unprecedented situation, very fluid. However, one thing we can say with some certainty, right, is that seven anti-Brexit votes from Northern Ireland would make a hell of a difference in the next three months. Johnson would immediately lose his majority. He would lose a vote of confidence. And what would happen in that, those circumstances is that there's a thing called the Fixed Term Parliament uh, Act, which was brought in one of the Liberal, Liberal Democrats, right? And it says, it used to be, Prime Minister loses a vote of confidence, general election, right? Now, there's 14 days where the Prime Minister who loses a vote of confidence can either show that he has now a majority, or somebody else can come along and say, actually, I've got a majority. Now, you know, this is unprecedented stuff. Nobody knows how this plays out. But this is a very real possibility that we're facing. Um, so that's one imperative, right? Which is this big thing is coming. And it has potentially appalling, I mean, really appalling short-term consequences for this, this island. 
the, the part of the United Kingdom that's worst affected by, by a hard Brexit, or certainly an old deal Brexit, is Northern Ireland. And the part of the European Union outside the United Kingdom that's most affected by it is the Republic of Ireland. Right? So, you know, the whole island's in this together. It doesn't matter whether you're Protestant or Catholic or Unionist or Nationalist. Right? This, is, this is appalling stuff. There are uh, the best estimates. Again, nobody, I, you know, I have to be really honest with you, nobody knows the reality. Nobody knows what will actually happen, right? But the best estimates, the most honest estimates, independent estimates, are 90,000 jobs on the island, right? In the, in the event of no deal. 40,000 in, in the north and, and, and 50,000 in the south. You have devastation for the farming sector in particular. Uh, you have, of course, the, the, the political problems, right? The, the border problems, the, the, all of that stuff. It's, it's bloody awful. I mean, it really is terrible stuff that we're facing. And you have an appallingly reckless, amoral, cynical ruling class in power in, in, in Westminster at the moment, which is playing, it's still playing games with people's lives, right? It's, it, it may well be willing to do this stuff. Ireland's collateral damage, right? They're not giving it down. But if they're willing to do it in the north of England, they're willing to do it, they're willing to Nissan plant in Sunderland to close. They're, you know, if you notice, Boris Johnson gave his first speech outside Downing Street, you know, and went through all these great British industries. Did you notice one he didn't mention? The car industry. Didn't even say the, the words. There's a million people's jobs, a million jobs in Britain in the car industry. And they will be gone. I mean, th those plants can't function. They're, they're all just in time. They're completely integrated into the European system. So a guy who, who, who cares so little for the jobs of people in Sunderland and Birmingham and Manchester doesn't give a damn about Northern Ireland or the Republic, right? So this is facing us, and that's one imperative. The other imperative is, and by the way, I, I'm not, I've never written a piece saying that Sinn Féin is obliged to take its seats at Westminster. I've never done that. Everybody else in my business has, I haven't. Why? Because Sinn Féin won an election, you know? Like it or not, those seats were won, in, and they were won recently, they were won in 2017. After the Brexit referendum, people knew the circumstances, broadly speaking, and they voted for an abstentionist platform. Right? I, so I was trying to respect that on the one side, and on the other side, look at this. Uh, this huge dilemma that's kind of, it's urgent, right? It's the next three months. The next three months could be a really, really critical period in the history of Ireland and, and of these islands. So what, what I suggested, and some people think it's genius and some people think it's complete idiocy, right? But <laughs> I'll just explain it very briefly. What if Sinn Féin were to trigger those seven by-elections? This would have to be done in early September. This is why this is urgent, right? You have to do it early September, and the basis for doing this would be Sinn Féin's MPs are standing aside temporarily uh, to honour their abstentionist platform, right? However, what's going to happen is then those seven, by there will be seven by-elections. In each constituency, you would put up an agreed candidate between Sinn Féin, the SDLP, the Alliance Party, and the Greens, right? The anti-Brexit parties. Um, and they would be pledged, first of all, to honor Sinn Féin's abstentionist policy in general. Right? So they're not going to vote on anything else except the Brexit issues. Right? They'll vote no confidence in Johnson. They'll do everything they have to do to block a no deal Brexit. And if it comes to a vote on a second referendum, they will support it. Right? That would be very, very simple. They will sign a public contract to this effect. And they will stand aside any time Sinn Féin says. So if Sinn Féin says, look, this isn't working, we don't like it, stand aside, and they will also sign a contract saying they're not standing for election again, right? So they're not trying to build a political base, they're not trying to make political careers. I'm suggesting they should be people who already have, you know, their careers behind them, or even, like Mary McAleese, for example, right? So, you know, big figures, right? You know, and they would just go in. They would terrify the life out of Boris Johnson. They would terrify the life out of the DUP. They would completely annihilate the DUP's power at Westminster. And I think they would have a very profound galvanizing effect on the opposition to Brexit in Britain. That's my view. Now, I know some people think that I'm 
dishonor Sinn Féin's mandate or I'm, I'm, I'm attacking them. Now, I, I think, and I've had a very hostile response officially from Sinn Féin to this. And I think maybe sometimes maybe very hostile responses because you've touched a certain nerve. And I think for Sinn Féin there's another dilemma, right, which is, is it better to have a really terrible no deal Brexit, because that pushes forward the day of the border poll in the United Ireland, or is it better to try to protect the people who are really on the front line, particularly in the border communities? And I think, but without, I, I swear I wasn't trying to you know, embarrass anybody of this, but I think the proposal touches that raw nerve, right? I think, that, I'm, I'm sure people will have a very different view of this. My feeling is that for a lot of people, uh, the leadership of are thinking, you know what, a really bad Brexit is the best thing because it pushes this agenda forward. My view is it doesn't work like that, right? You have to protect the people whose, whose livelihoods are on the line first, right? And I think, and, you know, I'm sure, again, people will profoundly disagree with this, I think Sinn Féin would gain enormous um, respect yeah. on the island as a whole if it were to do something as radical as this. But I, I, I'm sure people have very different views on this, and I'd, I'd be very, very happy to, to hear them. Um, I suppose to take the last question first, look, I, 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 honestly, I'd do anything anything that helped. I, I really would. Like, this is really serious stuff for all of us. Um, I, I, I suspect um, where I, I candidate it would be counterproductive. <laughs> you know, I think the aim here would be to try to bring people together and, you know, put, well, maybe I'm not the kind of character who, who, who manages to do that. But, I mean, look, absolutely. I mean, what I would say here is that this would have to be a process of, a very consensual process where, you know, Sinn Féin was at the heart of the process with, with the SCLP, with the Alliance, with the Greens. And coming up with names, you know, coming up with people who who, who would command uh, some kind of broad support across the communities. Um, in terms of um, Francois Tyrone, you're right about the actual results is very narrow. But if you put the Alliance vote and you put the Green vote and you put the SCLP vote and the Sinn Féin vote together, that's 54 percent. Right? The the anti-Brexit vote there is 54 percent. Uh, it, it, so you're right, though, to identify it. It's the one constituency where there would be, I think, a serious contest. Fact is, if you look at the anti-Brexit vote in all of the other constituencies, the other six, like it's of the order of between 66 and, and, and 80 percent, I and mean, it's overwhelming. You know, so I, I would be pretty confident that this this could work at that level. Um, it, in terms of your question about Scotland, you know, I, I think you're absolutely right. Like in terms of, you know, what is this economic relationship? You know. There's actually a very poor economic relationship between between Scotland and Ireland, you know. And for countries that share so much, it, it should be much, much more uh, of a unified economic relationship. And 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 I think common membership of the European Union, if Britain is if England's outside, would would really uh, generate this. And remember, this has great potential, I think, to reassure unionists in Northern Ireland. Right? You know, if 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 Scotland. Again, like I'm being very speculative, but could you imagine Scotland being a kind of co-guarantor with Ireland of the identity of, of, of unionist people in Northern Ireland? And of saying, look, we're, we're jointly saying it's going to be okay. You know, nobody is coercing you, nobody is, is interested in depriving you of your sense of self. I, I, it could be enormously important. My point here simply is, this is a conversation we should be beginning. You know. The, the, the Scott, you know, lots of people in Scotland would be very anxious to get involved in this conversation. Remember, they've got huge problems of sectarianism and this legacy as well. You know, so there's a lot of common ground I think here, which which we could we could start to explore. Um, the, 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 the back off question, which I didn't answer, I, I think you're absolutely right to raise it. You know, because if you look at the polling, that's exactly what they're saying, right? It's back off. And one of the reasons why we have to start thinking very carefully about this: what do we do? What do we do in a FECOP situation? You know, nobody wants to see it. I mean, you know, United Ireland is absolutely what I think many, many people want to see. But do we want to see it in that kind of chaotic situation where all of the subsidy is suddenly withdrawn? You know, where, where you're left with, with uh, you know, all those public service jobs uh, be, be, being in huge danger, you know? Um, like there's, there's, there's really serious problems to be thought through in relation to this. Um, you know, some kind of planning, some kind of contingency, some sort of thinking has to, has to start going into all of these things. I think it's unlikely, I mean, my, my, my sense of it, right, and I, I could be totally wrong, is that 
the, the British are going to be consumed by Brexit for another couple of years, right? So the the union question, although it's there and it's stirring around, is not in itself going to be the driver of English politics uh, for, for, for the next couple of years. It's actually almost when, whenever the Brexit thing is stabilized in some form, that's when we're suddenly hit with the fact that, you know, we wanted out of this union and now we're just, it's almost like we're stuck even worse in it because we don't have this bigger European context for it. You know, it's, we're, we're stuck with it. So um, I think we probably have a few years, but I, I, I just don't know. You know, we're, we're in one of those periods of history where things move inc could move incredibly rapidly. Nobody had a clue in 1914, you know, what 1918 was going to look like. And we just might be in one of those periods. And I think the more we engage in real civic dialogue, which is genuinely open and, 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 and generous and sympathetic and not threatening to anybody, and trying to think through both the practical problems that you were raising, but also the bigger, maybe broader questions of identity and belonging and how that can be guaranteed, uh, I think better for all of us that might be. Sorry, did I miss a question? Uh, no, just bring this gentleman on uh, ah, Sorry, you know, you know, you know, approach. You know um, it's very difficult to avoid anger. You know, one of Gandhi's great lessons to us all, and it was taken up by Martin Luther King, is, you know, don't drink the cup of bitterness. You know, if, if that's what you feed your children, that's what you feed yourself, you know, it's a poison. Very difficult not to be bitter about Brexit. You know, that, like the, 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 the recklessness, the, the amorality, the, the, the sheer pig-headed, willful ignorance that's involved in a lot of this. I'm sorry, I'm, here I am saying we should be, but we are. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's, it's very hard not to feel it. This is, this is a very aggressive, nasty piece of work. You know, whatever your view, you know, this is not whether you're unit nationalist. I mean, to do something like this, without even acknowledging that there's a problem. I mean, never mind having a solution to the problem of the border. But not even acknowledging that there's a problem. This guy called Oliver Norgrove, who was one of the big staffers on the Leave campaign, and he wrote a very interesting piece for the Irish Times about six months ago. And it was a very honest piece. You know, he, I mean, it's, it's the, he's the only person I've ever seen from that side who said, and he described an evening when they were in the headquarters of the Leave campaign, and they got a call from Newsnight on the BBC uh, program, news program, the evening program, and they were asked to go on and debate the consequences of Brexit for the peace process and the border. And he said, "We just sat, we sat around and we thought, oh shit." And then they said, "No, we're not, we're not going on, because if we start talking about it, it complicates Brexit." And the whole message, of course, is Brexit's simple, Brexit's easy. It's a slogan, you know, take back control. That's it. So, you know, once you let the Irish thing in, you start to unravel your whole basic message of, of absolute simplicity. So, they were, they, it's not that they didn't think about it or they weren't invited to, they absolutely, deliberately refused to talk about it. And if you look at the last major debate, there was the big Wembley public debate, and Francis O'Grady, I don't know if you know Francis O'Grady, who was the uh, brilliant um, General Secretary of the TUC in, in Britain, who I assume from her name has Irish roots. And she, she wasn't even asked about it. Right? So the, the moderator or nobody from the floor asked her about it, but she deliberately raised it herself. She said, I've just been in Belfast, I've been talking to people, this is really serious business. What, are, what is the proposal, what happens to Ireland if, if, if you go ahead with Brexit? And she was very passionate and articulate about it. And it went to Boris Johnson, who, who was her opposite number, to, to answer this point. Uh, you can look it up on YouTube, I'm not making this up. He says, in the Balkans, and he starts talking about the Balkans. I mean, it's just breathtaking. You know, the absolute deliberate refusal to even acknowledge it. And, and it, is, it is utterly, utterly immoral, you know, to, 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 to behave in that way. So, your point, I think, is a very important one. I think Irish people of whatever hue, if I was a unionist, I'd also be extremely angry that I think landed in this mess. You know? um, so of whatever persuasion, I think there's a right to be very angry about this. And it's equally then very important that we, we keep that anger at bay you know, and try to think as calmly and rationally as we possibly can about where we can go with this. 
I think, first of all, what can we do in the short term to, to try to protect those jobs, to try to protect those communities, to try to fight this thing? And, and this, it's still possible it won't happen. This, I think it's still worth fighting for. But equally thinking about whether it happens or not, it's not going to go back to 2016, right? We're never going to go back to you know, what it was like uh, you know, at the beginning of June 2016. Something has happened. And whatever its outcome, it has set in train some of these long-term forces that we were talking about. And you know, some of these wildest reasons to be angry, wildest reasons to, to be very frustrated, wildest reasons to be very fearful about them, some of it is the death throes of an imperial state that needed to die. You know, and I don't say that from an Irish point of view, I say it from the point of view of the English people, you know, of, of the Scottish people, the you know, people who have been subject to this state. I mean, you can't have a, a democracy where people say, I am a British subject. You, know, you can't take the word subject out of your sense of self-identification. And you can't say, I am a citizen. You know? <laughs> then you have a fundamental, profound problem. And I, I hope that the English people will come out of this with an English republic. You know, I really do. I hope, I hope they'll come out of it eventually with something much, much better than what they have at the moment. And I think if they do, and here I'm being highly optimistic, they might look across the water and they might say, you know what, thanks a lot to Ireland for screwing up brains, you know, <laughs> for making it not possible for this reactionary far-right project to do what it wanted to do. Uh, I think Ireland is, is playing its historic role of being the fly in the ointment, you know, of, of these great British schemes. Um, and and, and I, I think we do have to remember that actually in, in opposing this, this viciously reactionary project, we're not just helping ourselves, we are actually doing good for our neighbours. Um, I think you're absolutely right about language. You know, I mean, George Orwell is a very contemporary writer, you know, that, that uh, the use of language, the misuse and abuse of language is, is what you do when you want to um, tell lies. You know, it's a, it's, it, this is a very deeply mendacious project, you know, and I think you're absolutely right about the sort of deal or no deal as a kind of, oh, you know, it doesn't matter, we can just walk away. Um, you know, the, the, the most outrageous use of language currently is managed no deal. <laughs> you know, and you laugh and you're absolutely right to laugh. It's, it's, it's completely risible, you know, that we have a deal that's not a deal. Like, manage means we agree to manage it, <laughs> you know, with the Europeans, but it's not a deal. You know, um, so the misuse of language um, is, is cynical, deliberate, uh, and it's part of a very large international conspiracy of undermining the very idea of truth. Right? So, so this is not, you know, the Brexit campaign is saturated in Cambridge Analytica, in, in Steve Bannon, in, you know, this is, this is not just an accidental thing, right? It's a very, very deliberate. Uh, testing of these boundaries. And this strategy is, is based around the idea that you can, um, uh, it doesn't really matter whether people fully believe your version of things. So long as you put out enough versions that it doesn't matter. Nobody knows what's true anymore. I'm not sure who cares, you know, what's truth anyway? You know, it's that, that sort of idea. And it's, it's a sort of a flippancy and an approach to things. Um, and of course, what's true and real is, is, is the absolute damage that this stuff is going to do to, to, to people. How do you convince, like, so when you raise really the basic question, like, I, I saw workers in the, I mentioned the Nissan plant at Sutherland, right, for, for example. I mean, that plant will close, right? The, 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 the Nissan plant at Sutherland alone imports between two and three million car parts a day. When I read this, I thought, oh, that's wrong. I have to, you know, see a week. Two, two to three million a day from France, every morning, right? The parts go into the plant, and the cars are assembled. The end of the assembly line is a, is a rail line to the port, and the, the assembled cars go back out. Now, if you bring in, this, it's not even tariffs. It's like any delay. Each one of those parts has to be accounted for if you're not in a single market, right? You know, they have to be all set. You know, it, 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 the thing doesn't work. These car plants have no warehouses. They don't have storage space. That's not the way they work. They just don't do it. 
And they're not going to start building warehouses because the, I think the Japanese may already have decided this place is crazy, we can't do business here, you know, that they may already have decided to pull out. But yet you will see workers coming out of that plant saying, it'll be okay, we're British, we got through the war, you know. And, and it, how do you get through to people? I suppose that the question, that, that it keeps haunting me these days, you know, uh, there's a line in Bernard Shaw's play, St. Joan, where, where Joan says, uh, must Christ be crucified in every generation to save those who have no imagination? You know, do you have to keep seeing the suffering and experiencing the suffering before you believe it? There is a crisis of imagination, you know, that the people can't imagine the disruption and the, the damage unless they actually experience it. And half of me now thinks maybe they have to experience it in order to believe it's real. You know, and that's terrible. That's, that's awful stuff. So the, the, the excellent points that were, um, were raised. Um, first of all, in relation to your point about you know Hessel and Clegg saying if Sinn Féin takes its seats, it would be counterproductive. I completely agree, and I actually say that in my proposal. Right. So so one of my points is, uh, you know, I, I'm not t saying that Sinn Féin should take its seats, right? Precisely because, well, first of all, they have a mandate not to, but even if they did, it would, it would undoubtedly drive more Tories into a hard reactionary position than it would balance out, right? So you, you would be, it, it, it would work. Um, and I think this relates to your broader point, though, and I, and I think it's, it's, a, it's an incredibly well-made point, you know, uh, about the, the reaction to this. What my suggestion is, right, is that this is exactly why you would you would have the candidates be people of, who are not party political, right? Who can't be seen to be Sinn Féin stooges or anybody stooges, right? I mean, I've even, and I, this is very top of the head, right? But I've just said to my people like Adrian Dunbar, for example, who every English person knows from, from their, you know, their TV. You know, just, you know, people who have some kind of public consciousness, some kind of seriousness, try to do it in a way that is, you know, as, as, openly democratic as possible. Um, your, your point, I think, uh, sorry, I'm just, I'm just going to hear some points about, about Michael Davis uh, briefly and, and, and solidarity. Um, yes, in the end, Michael Davis got frustrated with being in the House of Commons, um, but not after, by being in the House of Commons, Davis and Parnell won the largest peacetime transfer of land that had ever happened in Europe, which was the transfer of the ownership of the land of Ireland back to the people of Ireland from the ascendancy landlord class. Huge achievement. Now, it wasn't done only in Parliament, and I'm not absolutely claiming that it would have happened without the boycotts and the civil disobedience and all the things that the gentleman was talking about. It has to happen on the streets, it has to happen out in society, but the use of Parliament to force through those land acts created modern Irish society. You know, that, that's where modern rural Ireland came out of, where people have ownership of their own land for the first time ever. Catholic emancipation, you know, was, 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 was what Daniel O'Connell fought for, the right to be in Parliament, to get in there and, and do so. I, I still think the game might be worth the candle. And remember, I'm only suggesting this as a very temporary measure. The banner, I wouldn't use it because it would be too provocative, but in my head would be England's opportunity is, or England's difficulty is Ireland's opportunity. It's one that's been used before. You know? um, we disagree about this, but I, I, I don't think it's an open and shut case. And in terms of solidarity, look, I completely agree with you, but that's partly my point, right? I think this has the potential to create solidarity across communities, right? Across those border communities to say to people, you know what, this is not a unionist or a nationalist thing, right? This is about preserving your job. This is about actually trying to focus on stopping this hostile Brexit, which is a threat to all of us. And I think out of that could come all sorts of new conversations. I, I think Brexit does, uh, you know, the DUP has been the fly in the ointment in this, in this regard, stop those conversations happening. But I think something like this initiative could, could do that. I mean, I think you're right, it's not gonna happen. I mean, I think Sinn Féin has been very clear it's not interested in it, so maybe it's an academic discussion at this stage. However, you know, I, I think you put it really very powerfully, and it's a very powerful argument that really should be taken very, very seriously. What's the real effect of this on, on ordinary people and, and truck drivers going through or people on the streets? 
All I would say to you is you have to remember that at the moment there is an Irish political party which is forcing a hard Brexit on the majority of English people who don't want it. So for all this rhetoric, remember, the rage at the DUP among people who voted Remain, but also people who voted Leave but who don't want this insane, catastrophic hard Brexit is also there, right? So yes, I think you're right, this rage is going to express itself in some way. There would be a counterbalancing gratitude from a huge number of people in England and Scotland uh, about saying, you saved us from the DUP. You know, the, I, I don't know if you remember the morning when the internet just broke because of all these English people. DUP, what is this thing? <laughs> that is now our government, you know? I mean, you know, the, the, the fact now is that on his own, remember, Johnson is now a minority government on his own. The, the, the majority of one is including the 10 DUP MPs, right? Um, so I think it's a very powerful point you make. I think it's, 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 it's a reality that, that absolutely, you know, is, 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 it cannot be dismissed. But I think it's complex in terms of the way this plays out. And the only other thing I would say about this is, we're going to get the blame anyway. <laughs> you can see it. You know, it's already there. You know, um, whatever we do is going to be wrong, and we're going to be blamed. Because remember, as I said earlier, you know, Brexit was always going to be wonderful. You know, it's 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 a it's a former golden age. It was a little moment that was going to be fantastic until it's a reality. And, and the serious point is somebody's going to have to take the blame when it's not. And it's going to be the immigrants, and it's going to be the liberal elite, and it's going to be the Irish. And, and at the moment, remember, the biggest discourse in the Tory press and Tory circles is the Irish. Right? This, is, this is the one that's already being planted there. Um, and I think we have to counter that, not aggressively, but I think we have to counter that by saying, you know what, you, you don't know how good we're being to you. <laughs> you. You don't know how much you will look back and say, thank you for putting that spoke in the wheel when our car was driving off the cliff. You know? uh, but I, I think we need to own it. I think we need to own the fact that yes, we do think this is crazy. Yes, we do think it's a reactionary, project which is also full of fantasy. Um, and we are the collateral damage unit and we're standing up and saying, we're not happy to be your collateral damage anymore. Um, and, and by the way, in, in us fighting that we might give you some courage to stand up for yourself and think about your own future. We on this island have done a remarkable thing over the last 20 years. The spokesperson for the Harland and Wolf workers has a strong Dublin accent, which is called Susan Fitzgerald. The head of the police force in Dublin, his father was in the RUC and, 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 was, and was killed in 1989. Um, he's a Presbyterian, an Ulster Presbyterian. He was in the PSNI. That's the solidarity. But this is happening, right? This is the unity of people. This is what it looks like, right? I know I was taking those two examples, but we know the reason why we are so outraged by the reimposition of a border is because we now know what it's like not to have it. Yeah. And a Angela Merkel, isn't it shocking that a German chancellor gets it long before a British, Chan British Prime Minister does? <laughs> Angela Merkel flew to, to Dublin in, in April. Uh, she met Leo Varadkar, and the Brexiteers were wetting themselves with, with delight, by the way. They thought this was the moment when Merkel was going to say, I'm sorry, little pixie heads in Ireland. <laughs> we were, you know, we, 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 we thought we did our best for you, but it's all over. The Brits have beaten us again. They've held their nerve, and your backstop is gone. <laughs> Merkel went and said, of course, we support you with backstop. And then what, what did she do? She sat for two and a half hours with people who live on both sides of the border, who run businesses on both sides of the border, who are in, involved in communities on both sides of the border. She listened to them, which Theresa May never did, which Boris Johnson certainly never will do. And what did she say when she came out? She said, I understand this. The first 38 years of my life were spent behind the wall. Yes. And I know what it's like when the wall is gone. And we know what it's like when the wall is gone. You know, 
We've been living the default kind of life that people leave when they're left alone. When, when they're not forced into these sectarian silos, they get on with living together and sharing the island. We've been sharing the island in extraordinary ways, ordinary ways, just getting on with it to, to, to a remarkable degree for the last 20 years, 20, 20 years. And we don't want to go back. And I think we have an absolute right to be not aggressive, I'm not angry, but absolutely firm in saying, you're not doing this to us. It's not acceptable. Mm -hmm.